tried so hard to see it took me so long to believe it and you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what we
this is my cross to bear this is my story to tell that no matter
Well, good morning and welcome to church. So glad you are here logging in with us today. And uh, I get the opportunity to share a couple announcements with you. And we've only got two of them this morning. So uh, first off, I want you to know that this November, we are partnering with Samaritan's Purse in their Operation Christmas Child program uh, in a kind of a three-part service project opportunity for you. Our mission with Operation Christmas Child, as always, is to pack shoeboxes filled with toys and school supplies and hygiene items for children in need around the world. So this is how you can be involved. First off, the whole church can be involved in gathering those items for the children and for those boxes. Secondly, if you're part of Ignite, the youth ministry, you can get involved by helping to prepare and fold the shoe boxes and get all the, the ingredients organized. And third, if you are part of SP Kids, the younger group, um, you will have an opportunity to pack up those shoe boxes as they, they go out all over the world. So if you would like to donate all of the items for a complete shoe box or two, the deadline for that is coming up soon, Friday, October 30th. So you've got to get right on it in these next couple weeks and uh, get all those items put together. So if you'd like to participate in that, log into the Church Center app. You can do that right now if you'd like, and you'll find the information, all the information, the details, under the Events tab. Or you can look for the, the further information that's coming in the newsletter this week. Secondly, um, I also, for the announcements this morning, I also wanted to say that one of my favorite things that we've included in several of our recent services is a little video clip submitted by South Point families. It's simply a hello, um, an introduction for those who might not know you, and a chance to share anything that might be on your heart for the church family, or um, even a prayer to, to begin the service and to kick off our service. And I know that some of you um, would be terrified to do something like that. But if you aren't, or for that matter, even if you are, <laughs> I would absolutely love it if you would consider filming a clip for us to use. It would be wonderful if we had every person at our church involved in this. It doesn't matter if you are married or you're single or you've got cute pets or no pets at all. Um, it would be so great to be able to see your face and hear your voice. We miss each other, and this sort of a thing helps with that. So, if you're willing to do this, 
go to southpointsd.com, our website, forward slash announcements, and it will tell you exactly how to do this. And all you've got to do is film a quick video from your phone, and we will take it from there. And as an example of that, we get to hear this morning from the Fisher family. And then after that, we will jump right into our message. So here they are. Good morning, South Point Church. We're the Fisher family. This is Sydney. I'm Brian. This is Ronan and Brittany. Before we get started this morning, I'm going to say a word um, before our message. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day and thank you that we can all be here together, even if it is virtually, and we're just reminded, Lord, that even, thing, even though things are different, you remain the same. And Lord, I just pray that you can bless our word this morning and open our ears and our hearts to what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning, South Point. I hope that you are doing well this morning. It's good to be with you. And as we get ready to jump into the Word this morning, let's open up with a word of prayer as a church. Pray with me, please. Lord, thank you for this day. We thank you for an opportunity to gather together again virtually. And Lord, we know that wherever we find ourselves, you are there in our midst. And we're so grateful for that, God. And I just pray that this morning that your spirit would be sensed and felt by every person who's part of this broadcast, everybody who's listening, everybody who's, who's uh, tuning in at home. I pray, God, that as we dig into your word, that we would find comfort, we'd find encouragement, we'd find wisdom, we'd find truth, all those things that you offer to us. And Lord, we want to be those people that are strengthened by you that are fueled by you, and those people that are walking in the way that you call us to. So thank you for this time, and thank you for this day, and we just ask that you would continue to bless us as a church. We need you, Lord. We love you, and we thank you for this time. May you be honored and glorified by this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning again, and, and I'd ask you to open up your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 9 today. And in chapter 9, actually chapters 9 and 10 in the book of Ecclesiastes are really, uh, they're almost a summary of the entire book. We're going to look at at several topics that we've already kind of jumped into at a deeper level. There's there's a lot that he's going to, to cover again. Um, it's, it's a recap of sorts. And, and the teaching method that is involved in that is the fact that as human beings, we need important information repeated. That's kind of how it works. And as you come back to something and you readdress something that you may have learned in the past, as you do that again, um, you, can, you can allow that wisdom to go a little deeper into your life. And I think that's part of why Solomon, the, the author here of Ecclesiastes, comes back to some of these big themes that we've already studied. Now, even though some of the topics are the same, we're going to look at them from a slightly different angle because that's what he does. He doesn't word for word repeat himself, but he still talks about some of these, these big, um, big issues. And this morning, specifically through chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes, we're going to talk about pressure. Pressure. Is anybody other than me, um, by a virtual show of hands, has anybody been feeling the pressure of life and the pressure of the world over the past um, several months? I, I, I think I heard some virtual amens probably happening out there. <laughs> um, we have. We've been under pressure. And, and I don't know about for you, but for me, it's not been necessarily personal pressure that's happening directly to me, but it's the pressure that is happening all around us. It's the pressures throughout society. Politics, like we talked about last week, all of those pressures that are happening. The, the deep wounds in our society over things like race and economics. The environmental issues like wildfires and heat waves and hurricanes. All these sorts of pressures have caused a deterioration of the mental health 
um, and emotional health of our world. Even into the younger generations who traditionally, the, the younger generations as they come up, they're full of hope and, and great dreams and ideas, but even they're being kind of swallowed up in the pressure of what's happening in the world around us. And as a Christian, I also see how these pressures are impacting our spiritual health and the spiritual lives of people throughout the world. And, and here's what we're going to find here in Ecclesiastes 9. Did you know, as a Christian that you have ways of finding peace under pressure. Peace under pressure. That's what we're going to study here today in, in chapter 9. And what we're going to look at are, are, are how there are some things that have been given to us, some tools that we've been given to find peace even though that we're under pressure. Now, when I'm talking about pressure, what is the internal spiritual pressure that exists in our lives? All right, well, that's what we're going to start with here. In chapter 9, verse 1, read it with me. He says this, he says, But all this I laid to heart, examining it all, he's referring to the whole summary of all these things he's been discussing, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know, both are before him. It's the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner. And he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead." So this is very similar to a lot of the things that we have seen throughout Ecclesiastes. You've, you've heard this argument before. Life and death, good and evil, righteousness and wickedness. And, and you realize that the preacher, Solomon, wishes it wasn't like that. It's not that he's just being nihilistic or pessimistic about it. He's saying, I really wish it wasn't this way. It's a great evil, he calls it there in verse 3. It's evil that this is the way it is, but this is the way it is. It's the truth. And when we see these kinds of things and we consider these things, just like Solomon did, we realize that it violates our sense of fairness. It's just not fair. It's not fair that whether you're good or you're evil, you're still going to die. It's not fair that sometimes the people that are righteous and trying to do the right things, that they fail in what they're doing. And the, the wicked people that are doing the wrong things, they seem to succeed. It's not fair. But what you have to realize is that fairness is an impossibility in a society of sinful humans. And guess what? We're a society of sinful humans. It's the shared wickedness that we have. And perfect equality or even perfect justice, those things are not possible because there are too many people and too many things that will slip through the cracks. That's just how it is. Self-centeredness will always look for loopholes or shortcuts or back doors or workarounds. That's the way it is. And fairness, the whole idea of fairness, it's a false worldview. Really what it is, is it's, it's repackaged karma. <laughs> you know, um, we, we talk about karma. You, you'll hear people say, well, they had it coming. You know, they earned that. It's the way they've been living their life. That's what happened to them. But guys, karma is, is not a, a Christian mindset. <laughs> karma is false. Karma is actually a belief in Hinduism and Buddhism and some of the other Eastern religions. And what does that karma idea say? It says that there's a, a causality, something that's linked together that affects the future of a person based on their deeds in this life. And, and what they do now in this life, whether good or evil, is going to affect them in their reincarnated lives. All right? It's not, it's not true, but that's what, that's what they believe. They say if you've done good deeds in this life, then you're creating good karma. And then you'll, you'll, in your next life, you'll start off in a better position. Now, 
that may be a nice idea that motivates people to do, to do good deeds, but it isn't true. And what you find is, even as a Christian, that this way of thinking sneaks into our thoughts and our views of the world. Think about it. Uh, probably all of us have, have had this thought that have come, it's come through our minds before. You know, you see some tragic event that happens to somebody you may know or somebody you care about, somebody that you feel like, hey, that's a good person. They're following the Lord. They're trying to do the best they can. And then, bang, tragedy strikes in their life. And the thought that will sneak into your head sometimes is, how could this, fill in the blank, this bad thing happen to a good person? How could God let that happen? Well, guys, that's not a Christian viewpoint. That's, that's karma. You're saying they're a good person, therefore good things should happen to them. Or the vice versa of that, if you say, well, they're a bad person, they deserve that. They had it coming. Guys, that's, that's not a Christian way of thinking. No, the Christian way of thinking says that we are all sinful people. That's what the Bible teaches us, that we all are depraved. We're sinful, fallen people. And no amount of, you know, good vibes or positive thoughts have any impact on our eternity. None of it. On our own, we are helpless. That's why in Romans 3, 20 to 25, it says this, for by the works of the law, that's like deeds, the things that you're doing, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Whether you're a lawbreaker or a law follower, no, his righteousness has been manifested apart from that. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. Here's the part that you probably recognize. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. We all share the pressure of sin and death, but we're all invited to share in salvation. In Hebrews 9, 26, 28, it says it this way, but as it is, he, Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, there's the death part coming in, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So what are the pressures that, that Solomon talks about here in Ecclesiastes that we're, we're under, that all of us share, we're all under the pressure of sin. And we're all under the pressure of death. That is a pressure that is part of life here on earth. But what scripture says is that Jesus came to not only deal with our sin and take care of that pressure, but he also overcame death. So those pressures are relieved in Jesus. Now, as we go on, we're going to find now how we can have peace even underneath those pressures, all right? And let's start there um, in verse 4, read from verse 4 to 6, and we'll find our first peace here, and it's peace through hope. Here's what it says, verse 4, but he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. We can have peace through hope. We can still have hope and push against the pressure of sin in this world. Even though we're... we're, we're in bondage under sin, when we come into this world, we find that we can still have hope. We may be a pack of 
wild dogs, as it says here. And sorry for all you dog lovers, but in the, the Israel, the, the, the Middle Eastern mindset at this time, the lowest of the low animals was the dog, a dirty dog. And a noble animal that was considered, you know, uh, something to look to, courageous and powerful was the lion. And he says, look here. He's like, at least you're a living dog. And being alive as a dog is, a, is better than being dead, even as this noble lion. And that's the way it is. We may be a pack of wild dogs, but we're still alive. And he says, because you're still alive, you can still have hope. And so it's better to be alive than being a, a, a living dog, than a perfectly noble dead lion. And in the, the New Testament, we looked at this verse last week. I'm just going to quote a snippet of it from 1 Peter 1.3. It explains this hope even more. 1 Peter 1.3 says, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So under that pressure of death, we realize that if Jesus Christ said, hey, I'm going to resurrect from the dead, and he did, then we can have hope that the same thing that he says about us, which is, I'm going to resurrect you from the dead, that he can. So we now have a living hope, a real hope, even underneath the pressure of sin and death, we realize, hey, we have hope. And so we have peace in our hearts because we can trust in that hope. Now, the second of the ways that we find peace is peace through contentment. And he's going to talk about that in verses 7 to 10. Let's read it. Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun. Because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Okay. First off, he says there in verse 7, he says that we're already approved in what we do. And, and what is his logic here? He says, look, you're still alive. So there's got to be some approval from God. Because if God was completely disapproving of you, he would have already wiped you off the face of the planet. So you've got at least hope in that and be content with that. He hasn't let you die yet. And what is the, what's the thought here? What he's saying is, hey, look, go ahead and enjoy what you've been given by God. Find some peace through contentment in what God has given you, whatever that might be. Find contentment in that. Now, I'll say this, every human being I've ever met could use a little more contentment. Everybody. In fact, some people could use a lot more in their lives, right? Discontentment is always something that we will battle as people. But you, guys, you got to know this. The comparison game will always make you a loser, it will always make you a loser because there will always be someone out there who is richer, who is smarter, who is better looking, who's luckier, who's happier, who's healthier, and on and on and on we go. Whatever it is that you're chasing, whatever it is that you're discontent with, the way you look, where you live, who your family is, what kind of job you have. There's always going to be somebody. And here's the thing. Even if you got to the peak of humanity in one of those areas, you're still going to find that there's other areas that you're discontent in. You could become the richest human being on earth. But guess what? You're probably not going to be the richest and the smartest. But even if you were the richest and the smartest, there'll be somebody who's healthier or stronger or it goes on and on and on. So it's, it's, you will always be a loser in that comparison game. But here's the thing that we also need to know, and we find out from Scripture too, is that contentment is something that we have to learn. We have to learn this. 
I think a lot of times people just say, well, I'm just not naturally a very content person. A lot of people are just, they're more content than I am, and it's, it's part of what drives me. No, contentment is learned. Paul writes that in Philippians 4, 11 to 12. Listen to what he says. He says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I now, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. It wasn't natural. It's learned. We have to learn to be content. And what's he talking about here with the garments being white in verse 8? Well, for one thing, living in the Middle East, it's desert climate. And so one of the, the things about white clothing or light-colored clothing is that it's just cooler in the hot areas, all right? But it's also more than that because the white clothing was also um, clothing that would usually be set aside for special occasions because you're out in the desert and it's dirty and so white can get dirty easily. So a lot of times the white clothing would be set aside for special occasions, joyful occasions, feasts, weddings, you know, good times, and that's why he's saying, look, let, keep, your, keep your garments white. Um, it's a symbol of joy. And that's what he ties into here with oil. Um, make sure you have oil on your head. Well, what, what's that all about? Again, that's a, an ancient use of oil. And they would use oil not just for like styling their hair, but also it would be perfumed. It would smell good, you know? And, and so it was, it's basically, it's the equivalent you know, for guys in our era to say, hey, take a shower and, and get a shower and a shave. Or for ladies, maybe it's, it's, you know, style your hair and put on your makeup. Make sure that you're ready to go for whatever it is that, that you need or that you want. It's the opposite of what they would also do in these cultures, which was mourning through sackcloth and ashes. You might've heard that in the Bible. What was sackcloth and ashes? It was this, this, rough, itchy material, burlap, kind of a sack cloth, cloth that they'd use to make a, a, a bag with for carrying grain or whatever. You throw that on as your clothes. It's this loose-fitting, messed-up kind of clothing. And they would literally take ashes out of a fire and, and all that black ash and soot, and they would put it on their heads so they'd be dusty and dirty and dark. And they would just, people look at you like, oh my goodness, what has happened? Well, it's an outward expression of how they're feeling inwardly. They would do this if they were mourning. Somebody died in their life. They were sorrowful about something. And he's saying, look, guys, just be content with where you're at. Bad stuff happens. Take the joyful route instead of the mourning route. Be content with where you're at instead of this other thing because life is short. That's what he's descri describing. It's the opposite of that mourning and moping around. And when we take this imagery that he's describing here and we move it into the, the, the time of Jesus and after Jesus, we can look at the New Testament and how it describes these kinds of things for us as Christians as well. As Christians, we are those that have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and have been anointed or given the seal of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I think when it talk, talks about white clothing and, and the oil of anointing on us, those are the things that I think of as a Christian. Isaiah 118 says this, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, because that's how we are when we still are under our sins, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. What is one of the ways that we as Christians can keep our clothing white? It's to basically stay unstained from the sin of the world. Deal with the sin that comes into your life, that, that God um, reveals in your life. Make sure you're, you're keeping a clean conscience be, be, between you and God. 1 John 2.20 talks about the oil part, the anointing. It says, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is often given, uh, there's a description of this anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's very similar to the anointing of oil that they would, they would do uh, throughout Scripture. This is what it's talking about. It make sure there's this oil on your head. Make sure you're being reminded of the fact that the Holy Spirit has, has anointed you. In Ephesians 1.13, he says it this way. He says, In Him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, so that means you're a Christian, you've heard the truth and you've believed it, and believed in Him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit has now come upon you and sealed you. By him, you've been anointed with the oil and the goodness of God. And continuing in the discussion on contentment, he moves to verse 9 when he talks about relationships. And specifically here, he, he says, spouses, enjoy life with the wife or the husband whom you love. These relationships should bring joy to our lives. If you aren't married, and I know that there's lots of you today that are here going to hear this that are not married. If you're not married, what does the, the wisdom of Ecclesiastes tell you today? It says, look for a spouse, not that makes you secure or can, you know, buy you a big house or a nice car or good clothes. He says, look for a spouse that you can enjoy life with. And if you aren't, if you are married, then enjoy life together. And, and I will say this too. If those important relationships don't be, bring joy, if the relationship that you're in right now isn't bringing joy to your life, fix it. Fix it. I didn't say throw it away for the, the newer model or the better model. Fix it. Because here's what we have to understand about contentment. And I think that a lot of people miss this. Not all contentment is passive. Sometimes when we think about being content, we think, okay, well, I've just got to learn to just let it all go. I've just got to let it happen. And whatever happens to me, isn't that what Paul is saying there? You know, back in Philippians, hey, whatever happens, whatever comes my way, I just kind of roll with the punches and I go with the flow. And what is, is. And that's just how, the way I'm just going to cruise along. No. That's oftentimes not the way contentment works. It's not the way we learn things. And I told you, you have to learn contentment. Oftentimes, learning takes struggle. It takes battle. It takes practice. It takes rep repetition. It takes work. And contentment is something that we have to learn. And a lot of times, it's something that we have to fight for. It often takes great work. In fact, God will sometimes give us a divine discontent in our lives simply to motivate us to grow. Sometimes God will take away your contentment in a particular area so that you push deeper to get to the spot of contentment that you need. And that happens in relationships. If your relationship is one today that is just struggling, 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 and you've just said, oh, I'm just going to, whatever, I'll just be content and deal with it. I said I'm in it for the long haul, just be in it for the long haul, and it'll be miserable, but oh well. Uh, you know, she works that way, I work that way, it's just how it is. No, fix it. Learn to enjoy life together. Begin doing the hard work necessary to experience that joy of life through that relationship. And then in verse 10, he, he stretches it even wider with our contentment. He's talking about work, he's talking about hobbies, he's talking about creative pursuits. He just says, go for it. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it. Do it with all your might. In 1 Corinthians, we have a parallel verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. The way that it's written there says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything. Do it to the glory of God. Jesus himself in John 9, 4 said, We must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. Night is coming when no one can work. Part of the, the life that we're in right now Part of the limitations is that there's certain things that we can work towards in this life here on earth in a fallen world that, that are going to yield rewards in the life to come in eternity. And things are going to be very different in heaven than they are here. But there are certain things that God has given us to do that is prepared beforehand, Scripture tells us, that we can do here that we can only do here. So whatever we're doing, he says, go for it. Pour yourself into it. Do it as you should and bring glory to God in it. God has given us these things to do in this temporary earth. Do it and do it to the best of your abilities. Now, the, the reason Solomon gives here is he says, because you're going to this place called Sheol. Now, if you're not familiar with that, it's a Bible word. Sheol, you'll find in the Old Testament um, pretty often. And Sheol was simply the abode of the dead in the Hebrew thought. They didn't know what was going to happen in the afterlife. 
They didn't have this robust theology about what was involved in it. it they were in the dark on it. And that's the same thing for, for Solomon here. He's like, I, it's, all I know is that it's going to be, when we're dead, we're dead, we're gone. We don't come back. So there's not going to be any of these things. There's not going to be work or thought or knowledge or wisdom out there where, where you're going. Because before Jesus, no one really knew what the afterlife would be like. And in fact, when he came, uh, it tells us in, in 2 Timothy 1.10, it says, Our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death, one of those pressures, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. You have to understand, what was in the afterlife before Jesus, it was in the dark. Nobody knew. I mean, sure, there were speculations, there were ideas, there were, you know, uh, all, all sorts of things built around, well, what if? But it wasn't until Jesus came and said, no, 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 let me explain to you a little bit. There is a place after this. There is eternity. There is eternal life to be offered. In fact, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to bring you there with me. He brought those things to light, light to us. And don't be confused. Sheol is not heaven, all right? It's this non-existent abode of the dead. It's a, it, it's a dead idea. It's not heaven. In heaven, there will be work and thought and knowledge and wisdom. And, and I asked uh, Natalie, our communications director, to put that heaven mini-series on our church website where it's a little more visible on the front page. If you are curious about heaven, Back when we went through the Gospel of Matthew, we did a three-part series, Digging Deep into Heaven. I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that um, because heaven is something to be excited about and something to look forward to. And so it's a, it's a great look at that. So we're going to find peace with contentment of where we're at right now. And then the, the third thing that we see here today is that there is peace through release. Verses 11 and 12 say this. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. We aren't in control. That's what he's saying here. He's saying we're not in control. When our time is up, our time is up. There are no guarantees. You know, and he gives a description here. He says the race isn't always to the swift. We, if you watch uh, NFL football, you'll see this every Sunday. It'll happen this afternoon. You might have the player that is the fastest player in the league. And you go into the game thinking, all right, we're going to beat this team because we've got somebody who's so lightning quick that nobody can stop them. And then what happens? They get on the field, they start warming up, and your super fast lightning bolt pulls a hamstring. And once he's done that, he's as slow as me. Well, maybe not quite as slow as me, but he's slow. <laughs> he can't do what you thought that he was going to be able to do. You had the fastest runner, and he can't even perform. That's the way it goes sometimes. He stretches it out. He says, are the battles to the strong? I mean, think of what it would have been like if we had taken David and Goliath into the gym before they met out there on the field, right? And you sat Goliath down on a bench press and said, Goliath, show us what you can do. All right, now, David, you see what you can do. <laughs> it would have been a joke. <laughs> or over to the squat rack. All right, Goliath, do it for us. You know, bend that bar. And here's little David going, I, I, I can try the bar. But guess who went home with no head in the battle, <laughs> right? <laughs> One of them was carted off and it was the stronger of the two. Just because you're the strongest doesn't mean you're going to win the battle. Just because you're the fastest doesn't mean that you're going to win the race. It, there are no guarantees. And I think it's the same way when we picture our own lives. When we imagine ourselves on our deathbed, we usually picture ourselves as old and feeble, that we've lived a big, full life, and we've gotten old and gray. But that's not always the way it is. That's not always the way it works in life. 
And what he says here is you're going to find peace when you learn to just relinquish that grip, to let go of of that, that hold of control, thinking that you can fix it and you can make it all work. You can't. And as we let go of that, we will find peace through the release. You're going to sleep better at night when you realize that there's a lot of things that are out of your control. You're going to enjoy every day more when you have released that grip. You're going to grow in humility and in joy. You know, we can, we can really feel the pressure of what's happening in the world around us right now. You, we can start saying, hey, when is this going to end? And how is it going to end? And how is this all going to play out? And oh my gosh, I don't know what's going to go on. Guys, I don't know. I don't know. God knows. And I'm at peace with it. I don't like it. I wish it was finished and I wish there was a cure and that there'd be no one else that was uh, threatened by this disease or any other disease. But I don't know when it's going to be. But I'm not carrying that around with me either. And because of that, I'm finding peace in it. And then the final thing that we find here in the last um, few verses, last five verses here, starting in verse 14, is that we find peace through wisdom. Read it with me, starting in verse 14. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might. Though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard, the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. The last of these places to find peace is through wisdom. What we learn here at the end of Ecclesiastes 9 is that wisdom is better. Even if it's ignored by the larger community. Wisdom is still better. Wisdom might not extend your life. It might not make you rich, but it's still a gift given to humanity by God, and it is the superior way to live. He says it over and over. It is better. And he does say there at the end, he says, but one sinner can destroy a lot of good. And that is true. Sin and death, the the earthly pressure that we're under, it entered the world through one man. That's what scripture describes to us, all the way back to Adam in Genesis. And when Adam sinned, we now, as his uh, inheritance, we've all received sin forever and always in it. But sin and death was also conquered by one man. And that's what it tells us in Romans 5, 19 to 21. For as by the one man's disobedience, that's Adam, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why am I saying that peace comes through wisdom? The wisdom that we find in the gospel message is the ultimate place of peace. It is the ultimate wisdom offered to the world. Eternal life. Eternal life. Life that does not end is offered to all who would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The wise will receive it. And unfortunately, the fools will reject it. But when we receive that wisdom, the truth of the gospel, that's where we will find peace like we've never had before. And those who trust in him will find peace. The pressures of the world are still going to exist, right? They will. You still may have that question pop in your head. Well, what if I get COVID? What if I get cancer? What if the economy collapses or the nation falls into civil war? There's going to be pressures in this world, in this life. But listen, 
especially if you're a Christian here today, listen to how Jesus answers those questions for you. In John 14, 27, here's what Jesus said. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Find peace. In John 16, 33, he said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have COVID. Okay, it doesn't say that, but it does say you will have tribulation. You'll have struggle. You'll have difficulty. You'll have problems. You'll have hard times. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And if you're looking for peace today, as we finish here, I want you to look for peace in these things. The pressures are here. The pressures of life are here. But the peace is available to you. We can find peace through hope. We can find peace through contentment. We can find peace through release. And we can find peace through wisdom. And this is a great verse that I'm going to finish with here today. And and we'll be done. I know I've given you a lot of verses today. Broke my rules for the number of verses I want to give in a message. But in this verse in Philippians 4, 5 to 7, this is a great one to think about and to meditate on, to memorize, especially if you've really struggled with finding peace in your life. This is a good one. Mark it up in your Bible. Underline it. Write it down. Post it on your mirror. Whatever you need to do. Here's what it says. It says, The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart's and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's a great word for us today. And I, my prayer for you is that you will find peace under pressure. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word here today. And I thank you for the truth that we can find in it. Lord, thank you that you have left us with resources for peace. And even when life seems hard and difficult and the future is cloudy and we don't know what's going to happen next, Lord, we pray that you would make us people that are full of peace because we're people that are full of your Holy Spirit. You are a God of peace. You're the author of peace. The Bible describes you as the prince of peace. And we need that peace. And we need to bring that peace not only into our own lives and our own families, but we need to be those bearers of peace that spread your peace throughout the world. We live in neighborhoods and communities and a, a nation and a world that is without peace. And God, as we bring the truth of the gospel to others, Lord, may we bring your peace throughout this world. May it be so true to us that it becomes evident and obvious to all the people that we're around. Help us be people that are peacemakers, that are bringing peace with us everywhere that we go. And I pray that today, if there are any who need that comfort and that encouragement, that they would receive it by your Holy Spirit. Touch them right now where they're at. And allow us, Lord, to be the people that you're calling us to be. This is, this is where we start finding your kingdom invading our world. And so we pray that that is what we would experience and that is what we would teach and walk. Thank you for your word this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would build our church, that you would grow our church, that you would make us healthy and vital and be the people that you're calling us to be. We love you and thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and begin to process some of what we've learned today and And think about those things as you enter into a time of worship. God bless you. Hope to see you again very soon. Good morning, South Point. Uh, Thanks for joining us this morning. I'm going to go ahead and lead us in worship right now. But before that, I'm going to go ahead and just pray us off. Um, So just bow your heads with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this great 
blessing of a day and moment that you've given me and everyone else, God, to be able to worship together, even though it's through technology. Lord, I just, I'm so blessed to be able to be given this opportunity, God. I thank you. I ask that you send your Holy Spirit down on us this morning so that we can enjoy worship with our families together. And in your name we pray. Amen. It is. 
my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build. To see my 
sin upon that cross I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross Here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Thank you, South Point. You guys have a blessed week. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. And praise Him. Praise for